ready to fight, we are ready. Amen. You got a good one. First one's a good one. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. Isn't it good to be in God's house? Thank the Lord for us being able to be here today. And the main thing is that God's here with us too. So we look forward to what he's got for us this morning. 247 is our first hymn. And that's on uh, He Hideth My Soul, page 247. As we stand together. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. A wonderful Savior to me. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock where rivers of pleasure I see. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. A wonderful Savior is Jesus my Lord. He taketh my burden away. He holdeth me up and I shall not be moved. He giveth me strength as my day. He hideth my soul in the cliff of the rock. That shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand. And covers me there with his hand. With numberless blessings, each moment he crowns. And feel with his fullness divine. I sing in my rapture, oh glory to God, for such a redeemer as mine. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of his love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand. When clothed in his brightness, transported I ride to meet him in clouds of the sky. His perfect salvation, His wonderful love, I'll shout with the millions on high. He hideth my soul in the cleft of the rock that shadows a dry, thirsty land. He hideth my life in the depths of His love and covers me there with his hand and covers me there with his hand hey. thank you brother jim you may be seated thank you so much for being here this morning we've got a number of our folks that are out today of just a lot of sickness going around i think i was at the hospital to two different hospitals two different times i was at the hospital four times this week twice with my sister in Greenville at St. Francis, and uh, then twice over here, uh, one at the rehab and one at the hospital with Brother John. Brother John's not here this morning. He thought he might get to make it. He is out of the hospital now, and he's at home, but he's still having to watch it and be careful. He's able to drive if he can. 
um, but the, the dizzy, dizziness has not completely left him, so he's having to be careful. Looks like he's, he told me he'd be here unless he had a setback, so he probably had a little setback today. Pray for Brother John, Lord might help him. And then Sister Jean, we'd received a text yesterday that she had fallen, and I think that's located her finger, if I remember correctly. And then, of course, she's been sick anyhow. But let's be in prayer for her, Miss Patty, Brother Leonard's sister. Uh, we've been praying for her. She's trying to get out and about a little bit, but they've run a, a, a lot of tests on her. They're not sure exactly what's going on there. But pray for her. Uh, so many in our family, our granddaughters, we've, we've got two granddaughters that are, that are real bad sick. Briella's got the flu. And uh, her mom and dad, I, both I think, have the flu. Our son and our daughter-in-law there in Malden, and then uh, our, our granddaughter Isabella in uh, North Carolina. She's got RSV virus, and I think her mother's sick with RSV virus. Our daughter, so just a lot of sickness going around. A lot of folks. That I, I was talking to a preacher early this morning, and they were talking about the different churches getting hit right now with some of this stuff, and it's just kind of come by different places. But the hospitals are full. If it's not flu, it's RSV. And if it's not RSV, it's COVID. It's something. But the hospitals are full. So just you know, we want to pray that the Lord might touch and help these folks and, and uh, intervene on their behalf. And then uh, some of our folks are not aware of it, but Brother Robbie had an accidental shooting yesterday. Uh, he, was, uh, he had a 32 in his safe, just a small safe there, and went to move a, a letter or something, and it just slid. It wasn't five or six inches and hit carpeting, which is so rare, and it fired. And uh, he, he was hit in the hand and had to go to the doctor, but it, it was the grace of God. God protected him. That, listen, that bullet fragmented. It decided to get to say, Brother Jim was telling me this morning, it fragmented. They gathered the pieces together. Any of those fragments could have hit him in the torso. It could have been really bad. could have been really bad. The Lord protected him. He did have to get a couple of sutures on his thumb. It didn't even hit the bone. It just hit the flesh. But uh, it, I'm, I'm thankful the Lord protected him. But uh, So we've just had a lot going on, a lot going on this week, and I know you have as well. The, sh the baby shower went tremendous yesterday though the ladies were really thrilled and I had a wonderful time and sister Amber was so thankful for all the ladies showing up and my wife was so thankful for all the ladies showing up thank you for all the hard work there thank you so much for that but let's ask God to bless us and help us now in this service we need the Lord there are folks that walked in here just just look like you and I but they're under such heavy burdens I can't imagine the burden they're carrying you can't imagine only God knows and they know but the Lord knows what they need this morning. We need to ask God to intervene and help them today. The Lord might touch them and help them. And each and every one of us, we don't know what we're going to face this week, but we might be under that same burden before the week is out. We need to ask the Lord to help us today. So it's important that we seek the Lord and his presence this morning. God's will be done. I'm going to ask Brother Mike, if you would, Brother, if you'd open us up with a word of prayer this morning, please. God, please do that. Yes, God, please. Please. Yes. Amen. Amen. All right, Brother Jim's going to tell us where to turn. Amen. Double good this morning. This is another one of Miss Fanny Crosby's songs. To God be the glory, and that's found on page 127 as we stand together. 127. To God be the glory, great things he hath done. So loved he the world that he gave us his son, who yield his life and atonement for sin. And open the life gate that all may go in. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Oh, perfect redemption, the purchase of blood To every believer, the promise of God The vilest offender who truly believe That moment from Jesus a pardon receive Praise the Lord, praise the Lord Let the earth hear His voice Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come 
to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Great things he hath taught us, great things he hath done, and great our rejoicing through Jesus the Son. But purer and higher and greater will be our wonder, our transport when Jesus we see. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the earth hear his voice. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, let the people rejoice. Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give him the glory, great things he hath done. Amen. Amen. Good singing this morning. All right. Let's spend the next few minutes now in our fellowship time and welcome each other and welcome our visitors. Amen.
delayed getting it started back. I apologize. Let's ask our men to come now and take up the offering this morning. Thank you so much for your faithfulness and your giving. We had another good week, good response out of the radio broadcast this week, and it's getting to be more consistent, and I thank the Lord for that, just different folks. are. Uh, most of the time now, they're just sending us an email, and um, of course, sometimes I get excited. I see this email coming to our church website, and I get excited thinking somebody maybe got a blessing out of the radio broadcast, and it's somebody trying to sell us some kind of computer thing. You know, it's always, oh, let me redo your web page and all that kind of stuff, but uh, in between those, we, we get a lot of those, but in between those, we get the comments, and I thank the Lord for that. Appreciate you giving to the Lord the work of the ministry around about the church. We had a good day yesterday visiting Brother Leonard and I, but we had one gentleman. Uh, it's about as close as we've been since I've been here, and I've been... I've been in some positions where they bumped up against me before in anger, and this guy was right in my face. He came right after us, and but I knew I had Brother Leonard right there waiting on me. I turned around, he's already in the car. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> he, was, he was standing right behind me, but uh, but yeah, this this guy was mad. I don't know what he was mad about, but he came out that door, slammed the door, and just jumped right up in her face, and and uh, so he wouldn't receive anything. We, we, we it didn't get anywhere with it. We just barely started. We offered him one of our packets, you know. And, uh, but, uh, but we find out later on from some of the folks around there that he's, he's having a hard time in his life and a lot of stuff between him and his ex-wife and all this kind of thing. So you never know. You never know what they're going through. But just be sweet in your soul and try to be a witness and a testimony and, and go on. Go on. You never know what God might use that in their life. But uh, uh, we, 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 we got back to the car. We tried to pray for him, ask God to help him best we could, but that's all you can do. You give as unto the Lord this morning. Thank you again for your faithfulness. Brother Leonard, thank you for the good Sunday school lesson this morning. If you would give thanks for the offering, please. Yes. Yes, Lord, thank you. Yes, yes, Lord. Father, now, please take the tithes and offerings, bless them, and use them to reach lost souls. Father, we give you all the honor and all the glory in Christ's precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for your giving. Let me make our announcements now. Remember our missionary of the week, Dr. Wayne and Sister Sherry Phillips. They're in Georgia and does a good ministry and been in ministry for quite a while. Let's pray for him. One of our, our more of a home mission work, but pray for them. Lord might continue to bless them and use them as all of our missionaries. There, there ought to be times that you, and, and you probably have to do like I have to do. I, I can't remember off the top of my head the 20 some odd missionaries we have that we support every month. And then others that we've had come through that we prayerfully support that we haven't been able to take on currently, but we pray for them. I can't remember all of them, so I have to use a list, and maybe you do as well. But try to pray for all your missionaries at least once a week. If you can, more than that, that would be good. But if not, understand at least once a week, be, uh, you know, make yourself, uh, avail yourself to the the point of praying for these folks that Lord might bless them and use them in a mighty way. It's difficult, different places right now uh, across the world, and they need a lot of prayer. So please continue to pray for them. And then uh, my wife said to give you ladies a special thank you for uh, Sister Amber's shower. Everything was beautiful, and it was. It went over w real well, and she was just thankful that uh, the ladies showed up and had a part in that. And uh, thank you so much for your uh, for your faithfulness in that and coming out to that. And I know Sister Amber appreciates that as well. Um, and then we've got another announcement. 
announcement, and I hadn't said anything on purpose this morning, but Samuel this week trusted the Lord as his Savior. He talked with Joe and his mom, and, and just they began, he'd been asking questions lately, and uh, he just wanted to be saved. And so he trusted the Lord, and, and uh, they led him through the plan of salvation, he, and he seemed to understand it. And so he, he asked God to save him. So we're going to have the baptism next Sunday night. Uh, we've been waiting on a baptism for Brother Anthony now for, I don't know, it's been a couple of months. And uh, that's part of my fault. I just got busy in my schedule and, and did not kind of push it in any way. And I don't I typically push those kind of things anyhow. But um, Brother Anthony, just, he's just a humble fellow, and he's not going to push it. But uh, he wanted to try to get, get a time when his family could come down. And we're going to try to see if we can get some of his family to come. Most of them are Catholic in background. And uh, we'd love for them to be able to come down and, and, and make sure they hear a good plan of salvation a Bible plan of salvation, but um, if they don't get to come, uh, we'll, we'll try to send it to them by YouTube or some other format, send it to them where they can see that and view that. But next Sunday night, now we're going to have the baptism with, with, right now, as far as we know, Brother Anthony and, uh, and, and Brother Samuel. Uh, that's hard to call it Samuel, little Samuel, Brother Samuel, but he is. If he's trusted God by grace and by faith, he's Brother Samuel now. So we're going to try to have baptism next Sunday night for those two. And uh, so we'll try to get this all ready to go in the baptistry. So keep that in mind. Um, and uh, please try to be here for that if you possibly can uh, next Sunday night. Um, I had another announcement. It just slipped my mind. What was I going to say? I can't remember what it was. I'll remember it though before, before too long. Uh, I, one of the things I did forget though, thank you visitors for being with us today. I normally always greet the visitors. Thank y'all for being uh, with us again this morning. We do appreciate that. Uh, even though we've got a thinner crowd of our regular people, got some of our folks out. But uh, uh, Brother Paul was telling me what, what happened. They had to uh, put Sister Jean's finger back in place. And I've had that done before. She dislocated it, so they put it back in place. So I'm assuming it's okay now, Brother Paul. I would mentioned that a little while ago about her. But. Okay, okay, well, be in prayer for Sister Jean. She's had a hard go of it the last two, three weeks, so let's pray for her with her health. All right, Brother Jim's going to come lead us in the last song. Page 144 is our next hymn. As we stand together, 144, only trust him. Come every soul by sin oppressed, there's mercy with the Lord, and He will surely give you rest by trusting in His Word. Only trust Him, only trust Him, only trust Him now. He will save you. save you now for Jesus shed his precious blood rich blessings to bestow plunge now into the crimson flood that washes white as snow only trust him only trust him only trust him now you he will save you he will save you now yes Jesus is the truth the way that leads you into rest and believe in him without delay and you are fully blessed only trust him only trust only trust him now he will save you he will save you he will save you now come then and join this holy band and on to glory go to dwell in that celestial land where joys immortal flow only trust him, only trust him, only trust him now. He will save you, he will save you, he will save you now.
Thank you, Sister Linda. Thank you, Brother Jim. Sister Linda's been suffering with a, one of her migraines today. She gets them quite often, and they don't really have a good remedy for her. And uh, But uh, she tried to be here this morning to help us in the piano, and I thank the Lord for that. Thank you for your faithfulness. Uh, even though she didn't feel so well, I appreciate that. But please remember her in prayer as well. The Lord might help her. Zechariah chapter 4, if you would, in your Bible. Zechariah chapter 4. This is a new message for me. And uh, it, it's still in development. Now, you know how I am on some of the, our messages. I, God will help me, and I'll preach it a time or two, and maybe here in someplace else. And, and then maybe the Lord show me something different out of a text. And I, I may, may come back later on and give you a second half to it. Uh, this is one I've got several points to, but I'm only going to probably deal with two main ones. I might get to the third one uh, and introduce it a little bit, but I, I really want to just try to get across two main points this morning and uh, maybe deal a little bit with the third point. But uh, we're dealing with small things. Who hath despised the day of small things? And I want to I address that this morning um, and uh, something pertaining to that. So let's look at that in Zechariah chapter 4, begin a reading verse number 8. Zechariah chapter 4, verse number 8, Minor Prophets. Moreover, the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also finish it. Thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me unto you. Now, Zerubbabel was the one who, who instrumented, was instrumental rather in the second temple, the building of the second temple. Solomon's temple, the original temple, of course, was destroyed by Nebuchadnezzar and the, the armies of the Babylonians. Um, and then uh, after the time of captivity, they began trying to get back over into the land. They finally got the decree to get back over into the land where they could rebuild the temple. And Zerubbabel saw that through and ended up build, rebuilding the second temple. That second temple stood until AD 70 when the Romans destroyed it. That's what he's talking about here. Zechariah is referring to Zerubbabel, how that God had used him to finish and restore the temple. Verse number 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord which run to and fro through the whole earth. I'm, emph I'm emphasizing that one sentence there, and I'm interested in that one sentence. Who hath despised the day of small things? There is no question that our God is a big God. If you're saved by the grace of God, you know he's a big God. You know, for God to get to where you were at before you could be saved, you know God had to be a big God. God had to be the only God. Psalm 95 verse 3 says, For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. The psalmist Asaph in Psalm 77, 13 asked the question, Who is so great a God as our God? In Isaiah chapter 40, verse number 28, the Bible says, Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is weary. There is no searching of his understanding. Nothing has ever suddenly occurred to God. God knows everything. God not only knows everything in eternity past, but God knows everything in eternity future. God knows everything. He doesn't have to search out anything. He knows everything. And there's nothing he can't do. Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 27. Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? And the answer is no. There's nothing too hard for God. You can't get so far from God that God can't get to you. You can't get in such a deep storm that God can't get there where you're at. God can go anywhere he needs to go. David said, if I were to go to the lowest hell, God would be there. If I were to go to the highest heaven, God would be there. Highest mountain, God would be there. Doesn't matter where he was going because he was a child of God, God was going to be there with him. That's the God we serve. He's a big God. He's a big God. Yet God has an amazing affinity for small things. It's in the Bible. It's amazing in the Bible the affinity God has for small things. The attention God places upon small things. In Luke chapter 12, verse number 6. Are not five sparrows sold for two farthings? And not one of them is forgotten before God. But even the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear not, therefore, you are of more value than many sparrows. A sparrow is a small bird. A sparrow is a small thing. There are a whole lot of birds bigger than a sparrow. Sparrow is a small bird. But your hairs are even smaller than a sparrow. 
And yet the Bible says that God is so, is so detailed, is, is so interested in mankind, in, in his, certainly in his children, that he's numbered the hairs of our head. He's numbered the hairs of our head. I remember reading a story about a mother, and, and it was just a story about the intimacy of a mother for a newborn child, and she's holding the baby and, and rocking that baby, and she's, uh, the baby's going to sleep, and she had sat there, and she was commenting, that, I don't know why, I can't remember why that came up in this story, but it's, a, it's an article about the mother and the, the intimate details she had with, with this baby, and she was counting the hairs on that little baby's head, counting the hairs on the little baby's head, and could number the hairs, and she remembered when the baby grew another hair. She was that detailed because that was her child. But well, that's how God approaches you and I as the children of God. God numbers the, the, our hairs. God knows the number of every one of the hairs on our head because we're his children. And just as that mother held that little baby in her arms, God holds us in his hands. He knows us intimately. And he's interested in us intimately. Things that we may think are small in the mind of God, God doesn't consider them small. I've been through times in my life, I, I, I have been, and you've been as well, where I've been through certain things, certain storms, and certain troubles in my life, and I just wondered, Lord, I, I'm not seeing you anywhere. God, I'm not, I know I'm not going to hear your audible voice, but I'm, not, I'm reading your scripture, and I'm not, I'm not getting anything. I don't understand what's going on. I'm looking for answers. I'm not getting the answer. And you start wondering, God, I know you're a busy God. I know you're a busy God, but surely you had not forgotten about you. No, God hadn't forgotten about you. God hadn't forgotten about me. God's interested in the small things. It doesn't matter how little I may be. I'm a child of his, and he's interested in me and my affairs. He's interested in the small things. I want to bring your attention this morning to some of the small things God cares about. Number one, God cares about small sins. In the book of Job, chapter number 15, verse number 11, the Bible said, Are the consolations of God small with thee? Are the consolations of God small with thee? Is there any secret thing with thee? Why doth thine heart carry thee away? And what do thy eyes wink at? That thou turnest thy spirit against God, and lettest such words go out of thy mouth. What is man that he should be clean? And he which is born of a woman that he should be righteous. The Bible says there in verse number uh, 11, Are the consolations of God small with thee? Is there any secret thing with thee? God's interested. God's interested in things, sins that we consider to be small. We may think that God's not paying any attention. We may think that we're going to be able to sweep it under the rug, but God's aware of it. He's interested in those things. He cares about the small sins. Matthew's gospel, chapter number 5, verse number 21, he clarifies it. The Lord himself clarifies it to us over here in this chapter, Matthew 5, 21. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time, thou shalt not kill, and whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. Well, that makes sense. You take a man's life after he's created in the image of God, you take that innocent man's life, you're going to be in the place of judgment. God's going to judge you over that. That makes perfect sense. Verse 22 says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Now that's something different. Well, you didn't touch him, you didn't kill him, you didn't slay him, but you're angry with him. God says, you know what he's saying? He's saying a sin is a sin. It doesn't matter whether it's small or big. A sin is a sin in the eyes of God. I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a call shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother Raka shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say thou fool shall be in danger of hell fire. He goes on to say in verse number 28 of this chapter. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. You don't have to actually commit the sin of physical adultery. If you thought it in your heart, Jesus said you're already guilty. Things that we may consider to be small and insignificant to an almighty God. He's a big God. He's dealing with a whole lot of big issues. But he's concerned about the things we think are small. He cares about the small sins. We may sweep them under the rug. We may try to forget about it. But God cares about the small sins. What you and I see as insignificant, God sees as a personal transgression against his holy being. And it is. It doesn't matter whether we tell a little, a little white lie or whether we go out and steal something off a shelf. It's still a sin in the eyes of God. 
It doesn't matter whether we sit out there and attack someone and assault someone, as, as we see a lot of the assaults going on in the big cities nowadays. It doesn't matter whether we assault an individual or we sit on a church pew this morning with pride built up in our hearts. God says you've transgressed transgress against his holy being when we do those things. The things that we deem to be significant, God says, yes, they're significant. And the things that we deem to be insignificant, God says, you're wrong. They're significant too. They're all significant. God cares about the small sins. In Psalm 51, David said, Against thee, thee only, have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. Psalm 51, 4. Against thee, thee only. He's talking about God. Against thee, thee only. We have transgressed against the holy, righteous God that created us, that saved us when we sin. Even in the small sins. It doesn't matter what they are. We transgressed against God. Now, Psalm 51 is where David deals with his adulterous sin with Bathsheba. And Bathsheba, of course, was the wife of Uriah. You remember that story. In fact, of the matter, what is the great sin, the one great sin that everybody remembers about David? Now, he committed other sins. He transgressed God in other ways. He numbered Israel one time in disobedience to God. It cost the land of Israel a lot of deaths. He did other things. At one time, he pretended to be a Philistine. He actually was a re-reward. The Bible uses that word re-reward. He was a rear guard for Achish, king of Gath. And you know who came from Gath? Goliath came from Gath. This is Goliath's king. And he's actually defending Goliath's king. He's their personal guard at one time, pretending to be a Philistine. David had sinned more than once. But what's the thing everybody remembers about King David? Great King David, a man after God's own heart. He committed adultery with Bathsheba, and then he ended up murdering her husband through warfare. Ended up having her husband murdered in order to try to cover it up. That's what we remember. But what folks don't remember is how that all started. Now, everybody's got their own opinion. And as I was going through studying this this week, I, I saw some, I just don't, I never have agreed with this idea. A lot of preachers, a lot of preachers attack David for not being out at war. If you study it in its context and you study the, in the context and you study the story, you find out that shortly before this happened, David was in battle and almost got killed by one of the giants in the land. If somebody else hadn't stepped up and delivered him, he would have been killed. And they told him, his own men said, now listen, King David, you're the king of Israel. We don't want you out here in the heat of the battle. We don't want you out here. At one time, you're a great soldier and you're still a good soldier, but you're older now. We want you ruling the land of Israel. You be a king. They had asked that of him. We don't know that that's not what he's doing. David never showed any cowardice at any time. I'm not buying this that David was afraid to be out there in battle. I'm not buying it. He was trying to sit there and honor his men in that regard. As far as I know, I know this much, God never dealt with him about it. If, if God was displeased with him being at home instead of being out there in the battle, you'd think God would have said something to him. He didn't say anything to him about that. David oftentimes, we believe, would go on the rooftop, especially at nighttime, and pray. This appears to be the situation. David's going out there on that rooftop. He's going, possibly going to pray. He doesn't say he's going to pray, but he's out there on the rooftop. And we do believe he'd done that before. It was common culture in that land with the Israelites. They would go on the rooftop and they'd pray. If you remember, Peter did that at one time. In modern day Israel, New Testament Israel, he went on the rooftop to pray and he had division, if you remember. So it was something they would do. Very well, he may have been going out there to pray something good. But then he sees there's a lady over there taking a bath on top of her building. She's naked. And what did David do? David had a choice. He could have been like Joseph. And he said, she could have said, no, I'm fleeing this and fled away from the temptation. But David didn't do that. David lingered. David stayed on the rooftop and he kept watching and he kept lusting. And then he, he, he moved upon that lust when he Hired, uh, called his servants in. He said, who's that woman down there? And they identified her. And then he said, go fetch her for me. See, David acted upon those things. But he started with just a simple, small sin. All he did was linger. The sin wasn't going out on the rooftop. That, he wasn't guilty of that. There was no law or, or command from God not to go on the rooftop. The sin was when he saw the transgression in front of him and he lingered with it. The temptation was there and he lingered with it. That's where the sin came in. And I've said this before and I'll say it again. Beloved, once you get it in your mind that you're going to do something, you're going to do it. 
If you get the opportunity anyway, anyhow, you're going to do it. Once you consider that it's a possibility, you're most likely going to do that sin. That's what happened with David. David lingered when he saw the temptation. Instead of immediately fleeing from it, he lingered. It was such a small thing. It was something only in his mind. It hadn't taken action yet. He hadn't, he hadn't committed adultery yet. He hadn't laid with her physically yet. He hadn't committed any sin yet. He certainly hadn't committed murder yet. All he had done is committed a sin with his mind. Most of us consider those things small things. Just in the mind. Just letting the mind wander a little bit. I'm not causing any harm. God says it's a transgression against him because he knows the small sins will end up being the big ones. The greatest sin in David's life came about from a small, insignificant thought. I wonder who that beautiful woman is. And then he acted upon it. It was a small sin. God cares about the small sins. You can convince yourself that God doesn't worry about it and God doesn't care about it all you want to, but he does. He does. Things that people do in, in, the, in the privacy of the closet or in their own home, or away from everybody else's eyes that they may think that nobody cares about because nobody knows about it. Don't you be fooled. God cares about it. And God knows about it. God cares about the small sins. He cares about them. That adultery of Bathsheba and subsequent murder of her husband Uriah was the greatest sin David, as far as we can attest to, the greatest sin David had ever committed. And yet he had the opportunity. He could have been just like Joseph and fled but he chose to linger. See, it's just a small thing. And all these small things build up into big things. This is how people sear their own conscience. This is how people harden their own hearts. Pharaoh didn't harden his heart overnight. It didn't happen just overnight. He said no to God, and then he said no to God, and then he said no to God. God kept being merciful and sending him another time and another time and another time and another time. Let my people go. Let my people go. Let my people go. And he said no, and he said no, and he said no. If you count it up, I have. It's recorded in the scripture seven different times. Pharaoh said no to God. And then God said, now I'm going to harden his heart. He's hardened his heart enough. I'm going to finalize it. I'm going to harden his heart. And God did just that. And that's what happens with us. You don't back, so listen, you don't get out and go in immorality, Christian. You don't. You don't go out there and get in complete immorality overnight. You don't just wake up one day being faithful to God, serving God, and then decide, hey, you know what? I think I'm going to serve the devil just as hard today as I served God yesterday. That doesn't happen. It's slow. It starts out with small sins. Lord, I know I'm supposed to read my Bible. I'm going to ignore it today. I'd rather watch TV. Lord, Lord, I know I'm supposed to have time of prayer with you, but I, I'm just... I just don't want to do that today. I, I want to get busy with my day. And you'll skip your prayer, and you'll skip your Bible reading, and then you'll skip Wednesday night, and then you'll skip Sunday night, and then you'll skip Sunday school, and then you'll skip Sunday morning. Next thing you know, you've been out of church a year, your family's destroyed, and you've lost all your respect because of sin. Oh, it was small to begin with. It was just one service, but it builds. That one little small sin God's careful about to help you not to commit it because it will build upon other sins in your life. Next thing you know, you have fallen just like David has. Once the devil knows you have an affinity for a small sin, he will target you. Now, I'm speaking from experience here. Once the devil knows you have an affinity for a small sin, you'll baby that sin. You won't completely cut the ties with it. You'll baby it. You'll consider it. You'll let it hang around. Once he knows that, he will target you with that sin. And you'll see opportunity after opportunity after opportunity for that sin coming your way. And until you cut the ties, until you absolutely say no more and turn from that thing, he's going to keep targeting you. He wants you to fall. He wants to build upon that sin with another one and another one and another one and another one. He wants to do that. If you ever study the life of, and I, and I don't know that you want to do it because it's a horrible life, but if you, ever, if you ever study some of these guys that got into serial killing and all that, that Ted Bundy was a character. He, he had been introduced to the gospel before. He admitted it. He knew. He could tell you how to get to heaven. Bible way. He could tell you. He started out just dabbling in pornography. It, just dabbling as a teenager in pornography. And it got worse and worse and worse and worse and worse. And then all, all, 
anything that would hold him back from doing the vile things he did, he gave himself over to that and Satanism. He just gave himself over to it. That's how it builds. Satan targets you and you commit that small sin, he gives you something a little bit worse. You commit that and he gives you something a little bit worse. You commit that and he gives you something a little bit worse. It never happens just overnight. God cares about the small sins, beloved. God cares about these small sins because the small sins lead to the big transgressions. And then God cares about the small storms. There's not a storm that comes in your life that God's not aware of and intimately involved in. He may not prevent us from going through the storm, but he will protect us while going through the storm. God may not cause the storm to cease immediately. He can. It's in his power. He may allow us to go through that storm, but he will protect us as we go through that storm. We've seen that time after time in the word of God. God didn't put that fire out in, that, in, in, in the book of Daniel, there's Daniel chapter 3, there's three Hebrew boys. God didn't put the fire out. He didn't put the fire out. He just put a shelter of protection among, among those three Hebrew boys. He protected them in the midst of the fire. He protected them. That's a type of Israel going through the tribulation. God's going to protect them. That remnant's going to be spared all through the tribulation. That remnant of the Jews are going to be spared. That's a type of that. God put his hand upon it. God does that in a Christian's life every now and then. God may not make the storm go away. That's what we want. God just make it go away. He may not make it go away. But he'll protect you through the midst of it. He's promised you he would. You're his child. He'll keep his hand upon you. He may not. He may not prevent you from going through the storm, but he will protect you while going through the storm. He's promised us to do that. 107th Psalm, Psalm 107, verse number 23. The Bible says this, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven. They go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad because they be quiet. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. There's a lesson we learn in this passage here. It's an important lesson. God's showing the child of God as you're going through this storm. God's showing you. Listen, everything in this passage here points to God allowing us to go through the storm, but protecting us in the midst of the storm and bringing us out the other side. And there's an important lesson in that. We see in verse number 25, God creates the storm. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. There's not a storm in my life or in your life that can come in our lives if God didn't allow it. God created that picture of the storm. God allowed it. He allows it. It's not catching God off guard. It's not that he's asleep. It's not that he's so busy with everybody else. He doesn't realize how bad it is. He allowed it to come your way. He created it, for he commanded to raise it the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves thereof. That doesn't mean that God literally made people do something, became a storm in your life, but he allowed them to do those things and act upon those things. Then God uses the storms to bring man to his own end. Verse number 26 and 27, they mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of the trouble. Trouble is more than they can handle. It's, it's, it's just more than they can handle. Verse 27, they reel to and fro, stagger like a drunken man, and are at their wit's end. That's exactly where God wanted to get them. Their wit's end. They can't figure it out with their own wit. They can't get the storm to go away with their own wit, their own design. God wants to get us there so that we have to trust him. If you could Listen, we wouldn't need God if we could cause the storm to go away or get through the storm with, at our, with our own wit. We wouldn't need God. God wants us to understand we need Him. And we need to trust Him. So we see there that God uses the storms to bring man to his own end. And then the moment they stop trusting in themselves and cry out to God, He calms the storm. He delivers the man. Verse 28 and 29. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and He bringeth them out of their distresses. Notice they, He didn't bring them out of their distresses until they cried unto the Lord. He maketh the storm a calm so that the waves thereof are still. That's all in the power of God. God allowed the storm, and then God calms the storm. But the thing that changed the action of God was the fact that they cried unto the Lord. 
They turned to God. That was his purpose of the storm to begin with. And then in verse 30, he says the only way to get to the desired haven, which is where we want to be in peace with God, is going to be to go through that storm. Then are they glad because they be quiet? So he bringeth them unto their desired heaven, uh, or haven. So he bringeth them unto their desired haven. If they hadn't have gone through the storm, if they hadn't cried unto the Lord, they would have never got to the other side where the, the divine haven waited for them, the desired haven waited for them. They had to go through the storm to get to the desired haven. They have to. God's wanting to get us to a place, folks, I'm telling you. God's wanting to get us to a place where we can walk closer with God than we've ever walked with him before. We'll come to the altars at home and at church, and we'll say, God, I mean, God will move in our hearts, and emotionally we're, we're drawn close to him. We'll say, God, I just want more of you in my life. I want to be more intimate with you, God. I want your presence. I want your power. God, I need your influence in my life. I want favor for God's purposes with man and with God so that I can get on my knees and ask anything knowing that God hears me and he'll answer according to his will. I want that close relationship, especially when we're, we've wandered from God and our fellowship isn't where it ought to be. We get on our knees and say, God, I want to be closer. God, I want to be closer. What we're saying is, God, I want to get to that desired haven where I walk with you every day. When I lay my head down at night, I say, good night, Lord, and see you in the morning. When I open my eyes in the morning and say, hello, Lord, and I'm in sweet fellowship with you the whole day. I want that desired haven. And God says, okay, I got to get your thinking out of the way. You can't get there with your own wit. You can't get there by your own end. You got to get there my way. In order to do that, we got to get you out of the way. And so God sends the storms our way to get us to trust him and quit trusting our own wit and our own design. And then we start complaining. God begins giving us the very thing we've asked for. And we start complaining. And we start saying, God, it's not fair. God, it's not good. I thought things were going to be perfect. God said, no, I didn't tell you things were going to be perfect. I said, if you get in the desired haven, things will be sweet. <laughs> we didn't understand that. God allows these storms in our life. But the only way to get the desired haven is to go through the storms, beloved. And the desired haven is a very special place. Isaiah chapter 54, verse number 11. The Bible said, O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest. He's talking about the storm. O thou afflicted, tossed with tempest, and not comforted. Behold, I will lay thy stones with fair colors, and lay thy foundations with sapphires. Those are jewels. I will make thy windows of agates, and thy gates of carbuncles, and all thy borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. That's the desired haven. God said, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to decorate you. All those are jewels that, that you, would see, you would see a wealthy husbandman decorating his, his bride with. All those are those jewels. And they're jewels that have an affinity with Israel directly. God said, you've been through the tempest. And not being comforted, but I'm going to lay stones with fair colors. I'm going to decorate you. I'm going to give you borders of pleasant stones. And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord. And great shall be the peace of thy children. God's describing to them the desired haven. But they had to go through the tempest to get there. You don't just wake up, beloved, one day and have a perfect walk with God. Nobody does. Nobody does. We have to draw closer to him in steps. But if we'll keep following him and trusting in him... He'll get us to the desired haven if we just keep trusting him, following him. What we have to begin to understand is that God controls all the storms at all times. God controls all of them. And we have to understand that. And that's sometimes we don't understand that. We have a, a difficulty understanding that. And because of that, we, we have doubts about whether God's going to protect us or not, whether God's going to provide for us or not. In the book of Nahum, Nahum chapter 1. Nahum chapter 1, verse number 3, The Lord is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all quit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm. The Lord, he controls it. He, do you understand that? Every storm, small and great, God controls all of them. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh it dry and dries up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth in Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. Then he says in verse number seven, The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. 
He knoweth them that trust in him. God controls the storm. The Lord hath his way and the whirlwind in, in the storm. Whatever he desires is going to be with that storm. Whatever. Whatever he desires. There was a few years ago, I remember reading about this. I'm not sure. I can't remember exactly when it was, what decade it was. It was in the 20th century. But I don't remember exactly what decade it was. But a hurricane had made it up the East Coast. And it was bearing down on New York City. And, of course, New York City already had the skyscrapers. I, I, honestly, I should have looked this up, and I don't remember the year that this occurred, but it's, 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 it's in weather history. That's where I'd read it at. And it was bearing down upon New York City, and, and there's a strait, a, a harbor that goes right from the, from the Atlantic, right in, straight into New York. And they thought the eye of this storm was going to go straight down that pike. They, they pictured it was going to go straight down the pike. This hurricane was bearing down on New York City, and they began to talk about evacuating the city. And they actually began some of it, but it's, it's a massive undertaking trying to evacuate New York City. And so they're trying to figure out how they can they get them manned down right there in the city because it's going to be a, a massive job trying to get them evacuated. The hurricane began coming in, and it actually it had begun hitting the outskirts of that harbor, that little straightway. They went in there to the city, and at the last moment, the hurricane shifted just a few degrees north. The eye just shifted a few degrees north, and that great storm bypassed that metropolis. It didn't hit it directly. They have no idea to this day what kind of damage would be done if a hurricane of that power would hit, would have a direct hit upon New York City. There's no idea. The loss of life, the loss of property, they don't have any idea what would happen. They, they really don't know, haven't had a direct hit. But the emergency was averted by just a simple shift in just one or two degrees in the eye of that storm. Now, you apply that to spiritual lessons, beloved. Sometimes we've got a storm bearing us down. I mean, it, it, it's looking like it's going to be devastating in our life. And we have to understand that God's in control of that. And sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Sometimes we do till we see this size of this storm and then we're wondering. Lord, if you're in control, why are you allowing this? It will destroy me. I can't handle this. And it begins to bear down on us, and that great storm in your life could be on course to hit you directly with a devastating power. But at the last moment, God just shifts it just a couple of degrees, and it skirts by. And what do we do? We sit there, and we look at that, and people around us look at that, and they go, boy, you were lucky. You weren't lucky. And all the great hand of God reached down and said, shift about two degrees. Now, Brother Robbie had that accident yesterday. And those of you that know the power of, a, of any kind of weapon, any kind of shooting instrument, you know what could have happened. You know how easily it could have happened. One of those fragments hit his torso and it could have been devastating. Could have been bad. Could have been real bad. One of them just go off and hit an artery in a leg. Uh, or an artery in the body, he'd bleed out before they could get there to help him. People will look at that, and I can guarantee you, people, friends of his at work and whatnot, they'll come up to him and they'll say, boy, you were lucky. What we need to understand, that wasn't luck. No, sir. No, sir. The hand of Almighty God said, bullets, I want you to shift just a little bit. Don't you ever think God's not interested in the small storms? If we're not careful, we'll look at situations like that and we'll think, well, that was a small storm. It didn't cause a great deal of damage. You don't know what it would have caused if the hand of God had not intervened. You and I don't know. God cares about the small storms. I don't think we'll understand when we get to heaven how great storms were in our life that we didn't realize were great storms because the hand of God said, I want you to shift about two degrees. We don't understand it. Could have been devastating. But God's got his eye on us. Thank God that he does. God cares about the small storms. Even when we, we wonder, God, where are you? I don't see you. I, I can't find you in the scriptures. I know you're there, but it just feels like I'm reading just words. It, it, it doesn't hit me. I don't feel like the spirit of God's moving on me. And it's because you're so emotionally distraught. You're so emotionally disturbed at that moment. You, your, your little world is crumbling around you and you don't understand it. We're, we're wrought with, with fear because we're fearful creatures. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. And we're fearful creatures and we don't understand it. Because we can't see God and we can't sense God. And we can't feel God. We wonder, Lord, are, are you aware of what's going on? I'm telling you, he's aware. Small storm or great. 
He knows what's going on. He's very aware. He's very aware. God cares about the storms and small storms. And then thirdly, I'm just going to give you two verses of Scripture. God cares about the small spiritual work. God cares about it. Job chapter 8, verse number 7. The Bible said, Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. Though thy beginning was small, yet thy latter end should greatly increase. We, we as Christians, we have a tendency to look at the big ministries, look at the massive ministries and how God has blessed them and used them in a great way. We have a tendency to look at those things. We have a tendency to look at smaller ministries like ours here and think, well, we're just an insignificant ministry. Don't you dare think that God thinks that because he doesn't. God cares. God cares for the small spiritual works just like he does for the large ones. God cares. Oh, we may be insignificant today. Our beginning very well may be small. But if we'll follow God, you don't have any idea what God wants to do. You don't have any idea. I don't have any idea. I can't even imagine how God wants to bless us if we'll just stay with him. If we'll be obedient to be faithful to him. Obedient to him. Be right where God wants us when God wants us there. There's no telling what God can use us in doing. <clears throat> Every great work of today at one time was a small work, just like we are, just like many other works around here. Every great work was a small work at one time. Nobody starts out with greatness overnight. God builds upon it. God builds upon it as they're faithful to him. He sees their faithfulness, and he'll honor them with with more. He'll increase them with more. And as they're faithful to that and invest back in the ministry, God honor it with more. God will build it with more. We see the lessons in the New Testament. I don't have time to go through all them this morning. We see the lessons in the New Testament. All the talents. God could give you one or God could give you ten. That's not the important part of, those, of that, pro, uh, that uh, the picture over there in the New Testament. That's not the important part of that. The important part of, the, the, uh, of all the scriptures God gives us in those things the important part of that is what they did with it. No matter how much God started them out with, what did they do with it? God will always give the increase if we're faithful to it. And then the last passage I'll read is Isaiah chapter 60, verse number 22. The Bible says, A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in his time. God built the nation of Israel. God, listen, listen to me. God built the nation of Israel in such an unusual way, and he did it intentionally. He used an old man, an old man, and a barren woman to build the nation of Israel. Their numbers are as the sand of the sea. That's what God did. An old man, beyond child, you know, childbearing age or, or having children, beyond that point, an old man and a barren woman that could not, she was barren, she could not have children. If God had not overshadowed her, she had never had a child. God used them to build a great nation. And God can do the same for any group. The hand of God and the power of God is the same today as it was back then. You just have to honor God. You have to be faithful to God and you have to believe in him. Abraham didn't trust in himself. He didn't trust in Sarah. He trusted in God. And God honored him. God cares about the small spiritual work. God cares about the small sins. God does. God cares about the small storms. God cares about the small spiritual work. If God cares about them, then we need to care about them. Would you stand to your feet? I ask Sister Lynn to come to the piano. Softly play a hymn of invitation. Maybe the Lord spoke to your heart this morning. I want you to be obedient to the Lord. Let him help you if you need to come to the altar. The altars are always open here. You don't even have to wait to the end of the service. If God moves on your heart, come to the altar. You come on right in the middle of the service. It won't hurt us. You'll be obedient. Mind the Lord this morning. As she plays softly a hymn of invitation, maybe the Lord spoke to your heart. Maybe you'd like to come pray. Maybe you'd like to come pray for somebody else. Maybe you know of somebody going through something in their life. They need God to, to help them know that he's in control of everything. Maybe you'd like to come pray for them. Mind the Lord this morning. Be obedient to him. Let him help you today. That's right. Some have come. Just mind God today. 
while she plays, mind the Lord. Thank you so much. Brother Leonard, if you would, close us in prayer, please. Thank you.